Hi everyone, I'm Robert Spetta and this is Westpac Weather 101. Western Pacific is volatile, destructive, and most often deadly. Well, this web series we are putting together over the next several months is going to dive into the different aspects of the weather out here in Eastern Asia and Australia, but also talk about some historical storms. Today in our first episode, we're actually going to dive into one of the most destructive storms out here in the Western Pacific and Eastern Asia. It is typhoons, talking about uh, what causes them, the dynamics behind that, and also also, what are some of the major impacts of typhoons out across this entire area? In short, typhoons are just a mature tropical system. They're called hurricanes in the Atlantic and east of the 180 degree line, which separates the International Date Line from the Eastern Pacific towards the Western Pacific. Also down towards the south there in Australia, we call them cyclones, and across the Indian Ocean as well. So really the same storm everywhere. In order for these storms to become some of the most destructive systems on the planet, planet they need to go through a series of steps much like how a human child evolves from a baby growing into a full-grown adult much like a human child the egg has to be fertilized it has to go through a series of steps all the ingredients have to be in place for the storm to form up and actually become a tropical system because there are a lot of ingredients there but they have to come together at the same spot at the right time now here's a list of some of the ingredients on my left First, there is the warm water, which is typically needed about 27 degrees Celsius or about 80 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you using the empirical system. But uh, it's not really a Goldilocks type system where if you have 27 degrees Fahrenheit, that is perfect for it. Actually, the warmer it gets, the more Latin heat that will go into the system and the stronger it will be. We often see this when tropical systems run over pockets of warm water, warm core eddies, much as was the case with Hurricane Katrina before it made landfall across the Gulf Coast. I'm sure many people remember that storm. But also in the Philippine Sea, warm waters often spur off many strong tropical systems and make them exceptionally strong, especially when you see those temperatures give above 35 degrees Celsius. So in short, the temperature of the water is a pretty important aspect of these tropical systems. Another thing you need is a cyclonic circulation at the base of the storm. It's pretty impossible to have a cyclonic storm without that low-level circulation. So a big factor of it. There's several ways you can have this most often. A tropical wave which forms up around the intertropical convergence zone. Late and early season storms we often see develop off of tail ends of cold fronts which come in from the north. There's just several ways but that is a very important aspect. Humidity is also another important aspect of this. You need a lot of moisture in the atmosphere to fuel a tropical system. Since it is a warm core low and it evolves off of moisture, latent heat in the atmosphere and also just drops all that tremendous amount of rain a very another important aspect of storm systems developing here next is that you need enough Coriolis force to develop a tropical system usually the thumb rule of thought is 10 degrees north or higher but Robert sometimes we do see a uh, tropical system develop below 10 degrees north like I said that is a general thumb rule sometimes we see them below there and sometimes we actually see them develop near the equator as most recently with typhoon Bofa in 2012 which hit the southern Philippines so it's a thumb rule and I know that we're gonna get some comments saying there is systems developing below 10 degrees north but the point is you do need some sort of Coriolis. If you need exhaust, so these tropical systems are actually cyclonic at their base, but anti-cyclonic in the upper atmosphere, which allows them to move away from the center of circulation. My thumb rule is righty tighty, lefty loosey. In other words, in the upper atmosphere, it is going to be loosening up and pushing away from that center of circulation. So you need that anti-cyclonic force or a upper level ridge aloft or high pressure aloft, in other words. And lastly, little to no vertical wind shear. I know that storms in the higher latitudes like this. It allows them to spin up and become extra severe, but tropical systems are much like a chimney. They do not want to be slanted towards the side. They want to have a perfect vertical structure aloft, and that's why we see these also beautiful eyes develop in tropical systems, and that is why when you get a little bit of wind shear or a cold front coming in from the north, it allows the storms to basically break apart and they do not like that 
at all. I like to think of it as a candle burning. If you have the flame, no wind on it, the flame will burn. But if you blow on it just slightly, it may intensify a little bit, which happens sometimes with tropical systems, but eventually you will blow it out. So very similar to that. Okay, so we have everything now to make a tropical system. What are the stages of its development? But let's go back to the personality here, where if you do have all the ingredients in place, it doesn't mean that you're going to have a storm. You put on Barry Manilow, it doesn't mean that a baby is going to be popping out any minute now. It just means that we have everything in place. So usually, when you do have these tropical waves that develop, you typically actually do not see them turn into full-blown typhoons. You have to wait for them to start to get some rotation, and if it does enough into the lower latitudes, then we have a tropical depression. Before I go any further, actually, I do want to mention that I am using uh, JMA Scale, the official agency in the Western Pacific. A link down below, actually, of who is the official agency in the Western Pacific. I often see people use JTWC or Pegasa, but and from the RSMMC and the WMO official is JMA. So we're going to keep looking at that. But a tropical depression is more like the baby stage of the cyclone development or a typhoon development. If we look further on and the storm continues to intensify, all those ingredients are still there, those warm water, low vertical wind shear, it will develop up to 89 kilometers per hour, and at that time we call it a severe tropical storm, still intensifying to 119 kilometers per hour. It goes through that teenage years and then into adult years, and that becomes a typhoon. Now, like I said, we're using JMA. If you look at JTWC, if it further intensifies up to the equivalent of a Category 4 tropical system in the Atlantic, they call it a super typhoon. But just typhoon is good enough because any intensity of a typhoon will still possibly cause destruction, even though the more intense it is, the more destruction we are going to see. So now we have our full-blown typhoons causing destruction across the Western Pacific, but what you may ask is, when are you most likely to get hit? When do these storms occur? Well, in short, here in Eastern Asia in the Northwest Pacific, any time throughout the year they can occur. There's no real definite typhoon season. Actually, a third of all tropical systems in the world often form in the northwestern Pacific, followed behind the Atlantic and even the eastern Pacific where those hurricanes form and then down towards the south in Australia. But the northwest Pacific, especially countries like the Philippines, Vietnam, and even here into Japan, often get hit by systems numerous times a year. Even into the midwinter months like February, we often see a tropical system, even a typhoon, once every three years. One thing that often changes with the tropical systems throughout the year, though, is their general track. During the winter months, they often stay into the lower latitudes, hitting places like Mindanao, Vietnam, even as far south as Thailand. A few of them do skirt off a little bit farther towards the north, but as we go through the spring and into the summer months, you start Start to see more recurving as the western pacific high starts to ridge a little bit farther towards the east allowing these systems to wrap around it and then eventually into the fall months that is when you start to see the storm systems really move off towards the north actually the peak amount of storms often hit around okinawa not until about uh, july into august and even to september that's when you start to see them hit around korea and into northern portions of japan but one thing i want to notice on this map is that the philippines unfortunately for you, you can get hit almost any time throughout the year. Another thing to notice though on the map though is that Guam, you don't get hit all too often. Why is? Because the Western Pacific High keeps a big bubble of high pressure over you. Now, in some cases, those storm systems will loop back into your direction. And that is one thing I want you to take away from those maps is that that is a general and average track. Sometimes storms do little loop-de-loops as we saw with our most recent storm last year. And this graphic, you can see a storm hitting Taiwan, looping back around, and then heading back out to sea and hitting Taiwan. So what are the impacts of tropical systems and typhoons? Well, I know we talk about the winds, I know we talk about how high they get, and that is often what is used to define the categories, but the winds are not really the most deadliest or most destructive, it is the result of the winds. The storm surge that comes ashore, actually nearly most of the deaths coming from the tropical systems often result in storm surge and or 
heavy rainfall as we often see with tropical systems that hit the Philippines. We see storms that could be a tropical storm and as the case with severe tropical storm Washi which hit Mindanao in late 2011 resulting in over 1,000 deaths. That one did not hit with a tremendous amount of wind but what it did bring was an abundant and flooding amount of rain. In fact is often what I call the sponge effect. The moisture pushes on shore into mountainous terrain. It squeezes it out like a sponge. We often see this along the eastern coast of Mindanao, Visayas, Luzon, even off towards Taiwan, and also with Typhoon Roki as it slammed into southern and western Japan, we saw an abundant amount of rainfall squeezed out by the mountains there. We'll actually have a whole separate episode probably in the next season on storm surge and the heavy rains and the impacts of typhoons, but the best way to combat these effects is actually education. Know what they are. That is actually what the whole point of our web series is going to be about. Trying to bring you as much information, educate you as much as possible on these storm systems and also what their impacts are across this entire region. Thanks for watching everybody if you have any questions comments or suggestions you can post them into the comment box down below also click this annotation on the screen if you want to subscribe to western pacific weather we not only have these westpac weather 101 videos we often put out tropical updates storm updates and even updates on earthquakes and tsunamis when they occur here in the western pacific eastern asia and also down there in the south for you in australia thanks for watching everybody and as always stay safe out there have a great day.